An Empire of Ice and Fire by Longclaw 1-6 Chapter 12 The Red Woman I've never seen anything like it, stuttered Samuel Tarley, looking over the palm. You gripped the lantern body, where the flames flicked out? Seeing the young marred skin for the thousandth time, John sighed. Yes, I did. Must you keep asking me that, Sam? He had answered the question over and over again. Thorn had called him a liar, disputing the entire story told by him about the crazed man in the Lord Commander's chambers. Gren, Ed and Pip seemed to believe him. Lord Commander Mormont. He seemed to be out of it the whole time. Thinking if... As if thinking. The same with the maester, Amon. Mormont had been forever grateful for John's action, hence the presence of a Valyrian blade in on his scabbard. Longclaw. Oh, would Danny love to see this? Something they shared now. All and all, the only one who didn't question anything about his story was Sam, the only person who seemed to be fully on his side since Danny. John shut his eyes tightly, willing away memories of her. It would only serve to pull his soul deeper into melancholy, and he couldn't afford it. Far from being the noble calling his uncle made it seem, the watch was a den of vipers, one that wished to bite him most of all. Is Sir Alistair making you doubt? You had to kill that thing somehow, John. And if you weren't burnt in doing so, just forget it, Sam. It's impossible that I could avoid burns. So something else must have happened. The rotund thinker was unperturbed by John's attempts to push him away. Another trait he shared with Danny. John couldn't explain why he was drawn to protect the fat weakling that Sam appeared to be as soon as he arrived at Castle Black. But in time, the trust and friendship managed to form. Come on, Snow. This is a mystery. Only those of old Valyria, if I recall correctly, can possess hot burn-proof skin. They used it to ride the dragons. A hearty chuckle that left John's lips. Please, Sam. Um, I knew someone. He ground out, fighting back the longing. Danny. Someone of Valyrian blood. That doesn't apply to me. We all know Maester Eamon. John cut him off. She wasn't Maester Eamon. John was going to we Sam was going to weasel it out of him anyway, along with Rob. He could trust him with his life. Even still, he hesitated with the words. He hadn't counted on Sam being as intuitive as he was. Well, the only surviving Targaryens besides Maester Aemon are the son and daughter of the Mad King. Did you know them? At John's nod, Sam laughed. Didn't know you were so worldly, John. Essos and meeting the Mad King's children. He patted John on the back. Next thing I know, you'll be telling me that the girl you told me about was the Targaryen princess. Eyes widening in recognition. No. Really? Sam literally squeaked. Hello, bastard. Biggie. Out of the blue came Gren, Ed and Pip beside him. Wrapping his arm around Sam's neck in a fake chokehold, the highborn yelped like a girl, causing everyone to laugh. Come on, man. Just busting your chops. The lad gave Sam a good-natured punch on the shoulder. Ed looked at John. Despite his smile, the lad was brooding again. What's got you all sullen again, Snow? Pining for a girl back home in your castle? None of them had been inside anything fancier than a country sapped in their lives. Actually, he is. Sam piped up, the three boys eyeing him with curiosity, while John just glared. He lost it to a Targaryen. Pip and Gren had wide eyes. What? Really? Snow? That's a crock of shit. <laughs> Laughed Ed. It's not Ed. He is the son of Ned Stark. A worldly man. Right, John? Sighing, unwilling to let Sam look like an idiot, John nodded. It wasn't like any one of them, him included, would ever see Danny. Aye. Daenerys Targaryen. She was the one I mentioned. It had come up while they were both scrubbing the dining tables in the mess hall. The conversation going from their vows to sexual prowess and at the fact he had been with a woman 
once before seemed pertinent. He kept the identity of his lover a secret, but it was out now. A whistle left Gren's lips. <whistles> Freaks, no. And I thought you were interesting before. Did she have silver hair? You three. Apparently, Cor and Halfhand saved him before, would end up killing it. Get back to latrine duty on the double. Gren cursed, freak this shit. Literally shit, he pointed it at John. We are continuing this conversation later. The three walked off, leaving Sam and John alone. Sam noticed John's sullen rage. Don't mind them. They probably miss girls. Don't you? John ended up asking, curiosity rising through his settling anger. An awkward chuckle left Sam's lips. I didn't have the much contact with them, besides my mother and sister. Was always too shy. Drove my father mad. He eyed his new friend over. You loved her, didn't you? I can tell from your voice that you still do. Enough of that, replied the brooding steward, face flushing a dark crimson. This was not something he wished to discuss further. Brought too many unwelcome feelings. Danny was gone, and he had to live with it. Did you find out about anything about what I faced in the Lord Commander's quarters? Thorn had been convinced it was a wildling, and browbeated anyone who thought differently. The old bear seemed to disagree with the assessment. John could tell, but he kept it to himself. Thus, John convinced Sam to get to the bottom of it themselves. Nodding, Sam stumbled a bit, trying to get something out of a small chest that housed his worldly possessions. John couldn't help but smile. Sam was so unsuited to fighting it was comical. But there was no one better to provide advice and analysis. Um, yes, I think it was a white. One eyebrow raised. A white? Those aren't anything but myths and legends from the story of the Long Night. John remembered being told that story back as a kid, cuddling up with Rob and Sansa, back when the three of them were as thick as thieves. Not necessarily, John. Think about something Mace Raymond told me. If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, is the truth. No human could have survived a sword thrust to the chest. Perhaps I didn't hit the heart. Sam raised an eyebrow, casting doubt upon that. John's thrusts were always true and accurate. Point taken, but still, a white? It says in the texts, only fire can kill whites. Why do you think the wildlings always burn their dead? Think about it. Wildling raids to try and get over the wall have tripled in the last year. Your uncle disappeared. But no peep from any wildling bands. They like to show off their work. Sorry. Sam had the decency to look apologetic. Sighing, John let it go. He had grieved enough for Benjamin. Though there was no proof he was actually dead. Tis fine. Parting ways with Sam, John offered his hand to his neck. Feeling the cold chain of gold wrapping around it. Fingering the tiny dragon nestled within. Oh, Danny. He murmured, I hope you have found happiness without me. Come on, Rhaegal. I know you can do it, like your brothers. Twirling the small chunk of horse flesh in her fingers, Daenerys watched the youngest and smallest of her dragon children with a maternal humour. The green dragon didn't have the same stamina as Balerion and Edoron, both almost ravenous in their appetites, whereas Rhaegal was picky as if uncomfortable without special care. Dracarys. Finally, a small tongue of flame left his mouth, cooking the meat. There you go, my sweet. Why is it so difficult with you? She chided. Rigel cocked his scaled head to the side, blinking. It caused a laugh to leave Danny's lips. Dragons were mysterious and intelligent creatures. So if there was something fundamental missing in his life, when the growing dragon would clearly notice it. However, now fed, he let out a screech and flew into the sky to find his brothers. My queen! Entering the tent, Sir Jorah walked straight up to her. Unlike the rest of her subjects, 
Jorath seemed to earn the right to dispense with the usual protocol of supplication and greeting. While not as elaborate as in Westeros or the city-states of Slaver's Bay, the Dothraki did have their own customs. Turning to greet him, her serene smile fell at his frown, one of sadness and worry. What happened? Tell me. Danny demanded. News from Westeros. The usurper is dead. His son Joffrey has been crowned. And how is that bad news? Danny remembered the golden-haired moron well. How he seemed so suave and charming, but two servants and guards had a cruel streak from Winterfell to dawn. The usurper was an oath, but at least he had the sense to entrust competent counsellors. Jorah sighed, knowing it would devastate her, but Barristan and he knew she deserved to hear it. His first act as king was to order Lord St Eddard Stark's arrest for treason. He watched as her eyes widened. Lord Stark was executed at the Sept of Baelor at Joffrey's command. The news hit her like a rock slide. Ned Stark? Dead? He had saved her from living life as a broodmare. He and Jon descending like angels from the heavens to rescue her from her brother's clutches. Gave her the one moment of love in her entire life. Tears threatening to well in her eyes. But surprisingly, she remained calm. Fetch Sir Barristan. I will need to speak with both of you. At once, Khaleesi. What she would give to just be able to sit and relax with Arya, Rhaegar and her dragons. The twins had already fed from her an hour before. Daenerys had absolutely forbade any wet nurse being summoned. Instead, insistent on feeding them herself. And she missed them something fierce. Missed their comforting effect on her especially now. But her duty mattered. Her commitment to her house mattered. Daenerys Targaryen would rule the Seven Kingdoms once again, as both a queen and as a mother. She would just have to find the right balance. It was what she wanted. It is what Jon would want. Danny bit back the thoughts of her love. The ever-present spectre in her dreams. The thoughts would only distract her. Jorah returned with Sir Barristan rather quickly. The old knight bowed. Yes, my queen? Unlike others who might have enjoyed watching another human being supplicate to them, Daenerys wasn't that sort of ruler. Overpenitence disgusted her, and those that demanded overpenitence disgusted her even more. Stop it, Sir Barristan. You have my leave to be informal and frank. As you wish, your grace. I assume you have heard about Eddard Stark. She steadied herself. I did. The loss of a wonderful man. It is in his honour that we continue to fight. What is the state of Westeros? Joffrey controls King's Landing and the Westerlands, but it faces enemies. Renly Baratheon has married the daughter of Mace Tyrell and marshals the forces of the Stormlands the Reach against his nephew, Rob Stark. Daenerys remembered him well, even if they hadn't been introduced. Thoughtful, kind young man who clearly loved John, has declared himself the King of the North, and has rallied the Riverlands as well. Dawn and the Vale are neutral. Passing her lips, Daenerys analysed the situation. They had the Dothraki Horde, but no ships, and no means of fighting on even grounds with the heavy ma armies of Westeros. D the Dothraki could overwhelm them with numbers alone, but that would get bloody rather fast. So, Sir Barristan, she addressed him. If you were in my position, what would you do to require a significantly powerful infantry force to supplement my Dothraki light cavalry? Daenerys was humble enough to admit she was no expert in military tactics, and there was no shame in seeking counsel of someone else. I may presume that you would not advise basing my army around the swords of the Free Cities. An impressed glance crossed Barristan's eyes. That is correct, Your Grace. Sellswords, even ones such as the Golden Company, that can function as a rather impressive standing army. Their loyalty is a question mark. If they themselves, or their benefactors, deem they can find a better deal elsewhere, then any patron is out of luck. No, only an army that is loyal will serve your ends. He smiled at her. And there is only one of that kind in Essos. A finger stabbed at the city of Slaver's Bay, in the centre of the map. 
Danny blinked. Astapor? Yes, more significantly, a slave army renowned for its fighting prowess. Their proper High Valyrian name is hard to pronounce for a Westeros. Sir Jorah chuckled, and Danny couldn't help herself from smirking at that. But they have an informal and far more infamous name. The Unsullied. Your Grace, this is a rather enormous request, coughed Tyrion Lannister. It was only his first week back in King's Landing. The King's Landing now ruled by his nephew, and only his third day as the interim hand of the King. Already he wished he could pull his own hair out and smash something in frustration. To issue this many death warrants on issues that do not involve treason? And on innocent children. While he may have been able to issue the sort of rough discipline Joffrey needed, his mother refused to meet out, and his father couldn't care less to implement. Now that the vicious idiot was the king, made it impossible. Tyrion could only obey, or by some miracle, convince him. The hand speaks truly, your grace, the little finger added, surprising Tyrion. Coming to King's Landing and finding the snake one of Joffrey's top political advisers had been a shock, but outmaneuvering Stannis Baratheon and saving the king where Cersei could not had been a masterstroke. There is no purpose in this. Normally smug and vicious, as he sat on the small council table, the king seemed ashen. The king's word is law. Therefore, the king's will must be done. The words were croaked out. But... Your grace, eyes blazed at Tyrion. The dwarf lowered his gaze in supplements. Finding all your father's alleged bastards would be an enormous undertaking. How do we even know which ones to find? Stuttering, the ancient oaf Pycelle dropped a ledger on the table. Now, excuse me, Lord Hand, but Ned Stark had compiled copious notes built on John Arryn's. <coughs> A hacking cough left his lungs. Disgusting, Tyrion. How that filthy coot is still alive continues to baffle me. We will be able to find them easily. Then it is settled. Joffrey boomed, ending the debate. The city garrison will find every one of these swine and kill them. Meryn Trant will oversee this. I shifted to the figure standing next to Sir Gregor, both the official bodyguards of the king. A sick grin spread across his face. It will be my pleasure, my king. And I am surrounded by sadistic bastards. Tyrion muttered inaudibly, and how Varys snorted softly. He figured the shifty eunuch must have heard him. The doors that took a moment to open swung wide open, a page entering. Y your grace, there is a visitor for you in the throne room, needing your audience. I thought I wasn't to be disturbed. Joffrey hissed. The page started to cower. Tyrion sincerely hoped it wouldn't be a repeat of the minstrel debacle. Deliverance for the hopeless page came in the form of Peter Baelish. Apologies, but I was the one who arranged this. These visitors are arriving from Dragonstone, just two days ago, seeking your audience, and I believe they will prove useful in securing your continued reign. Tyrion joined the others in the retinue to stand and bow as Joffrey rose. They all formed a line behind their sovereign, corresponding to their status. While the highest official rank, he was behind both Littlefinger and his sweet sister, each flanking the diminutive king from each side. And how is any visitor so crucial to his reign? Snide came easily to Cersei. Having known her for all his life, Tyrion should know. While not as smart and far less effective than Littlefinger, at least the imp could read her, Baelish was enigmatic as ever. From Dragonstone, no less? Perhaps a last-ditch attempt by supporters of Stannis Baratheon? No! Joffrey screamed. He is Stannis the traitor! Even in death, he deserves no title! The retinue was silent, including Tyrion. The lad would never raise his voice at his beloved mother. Until now. Had it been any other instance, the look on his sister's face would have sent him into a fit of giggles. Forgive me, your grace, she allowed. Stannis the traitor could have easily set up this in case of his death. I assure you, honoured king, I can personally attest to their trustworthiness. Joffrey passed his lips. 
Uncle, what do you say? Tyrion blinked. You have the best of gods, your grace. He spared a glance at both Trant and Gregor, skin crawling. I am sure there is no danger with at least hearing what the visitors have to say. Lord Irenly has the city surrounded, and we could use any aid that would make your coming victory all the more decisive. Choosing his words carefully, ever he could find himself on Joffrey's good side from time to time. From the death glare Cersei was giving him, staying on the king's good graces was vital in more way than one. The king nodded. Very well. Two loud horns announced the presence of the king, an idea suggested by Baelish, and one Joffrey fell in love with, with everyone in the throne room bowing deeply at the booming sound. Tyrion had to admit it was a pretty hefty power trip. Arrogantly draping himself on the Iron Throne, a plush cushion placed on the hard surfaces of the melted swords of Aegon the Conqueror's enemies. Joffrey gestured to the gathered persons to stand. And who do we have to see me today? My king, Littlefinger announced. May I present to you Melisandre of Ashai and Sir Davil Seaworth. They have travelled from Dragonstone, braving vengeful Baratheon loyalists now allied with Renly the traitor to arrive here. Tyrion's eyes drifted to the two figures. One was a rather hardened sea dog of a man, bold and tough. The other, one of the most striking women he had ever seen. Blessed with fiery red tresses and high cheekbones. Oh, if I wasn't a dwarf. At least he had Shay. Please state your business with Joffrey of House Baratheon, first of his name, King of the Andals and the Rhoynar, and the First Men. Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm. Curtsying in her flowing dress, the Lady Melisandre gazed up at the Iron Throne. Greetings, great king. I am honoured and humbled to have set my eyes upon the Golden Prince. A snort left Joffrey's lips. It may be lost on you, but as all can see here, I am the king. Derision marred his fair features. I am a busy man, so be out with what you want, or I'll see you hanged. Your grace. Davos snelt, speaking for the first time. His eyes were kept trained on the floor as he addressed his king. The Lady Melisandre is a powerful priestess, and she seeks to inform you of the Lord of Light. In his mind, he wasn't sure if he believed it himself, but the Red Priestess was an enigma. Lord Stannis entrusted him to care for her, and he would do so. The Lord of Light? Tyrion was in a mind to chuckle sarcastically. From what he had heard, worshippers of the fringe cult were common in Essos, and spreading amongst the small-spoken Dawn and the Crown Barons or hogwash in his opinion. But what shocked him was how the king immediately sat ramrod straight, eyes widening. It wasn't lost on Littlefinger, or Cersei. Pycelle was too bullheaded to notice. Say your piece now, Joffrey demanded. There is a prophecy, honoured king, one that tells of a long night, of one that will rule all that stands before him, of the return of the Great One, the Lightbringer, Joffrey visibly stiffened, all colour draining from his face. Stannis Baratheon believed he was the prince that was promised, or that he would keep guard of the kingdom for when the prince arrived. Stannis the traitor was a troubled man with many delusions of grandeur. Cersei dismissed, slightly perturbed that Joffrey hadn't gone into a fit of rage at his uncle's actual name. The Lord of Light is a myth. Standing firm, Melisandre did not back down. I can assure you, the prophecy is real. Stannis was consumed by it, and he set in motion a chain of events before he left Dragonstone that even I cannot control. Only the great king can stop the coming chaos, the king standing before us. Though your devotion to our king is commendable, we cannot spare time for nonsense. See to it that our guests are treated to the best of accommodations, Lord Baelish. Joffrey ordered, interrupting his mother. Well, this is interesting. Tyrion made a mental note to get to know this Melisandre quite well in the future. I'm not going to read the last scene of this chapter. Basically, Melisandre goes to Tyrion Lannister's war camp and seduces him, so he becomes the father of her shadow baby. Yeah, this fic gets a bit trippy at times. <laughs> 
Anyway, hope you enjoyed this, everybody. Remember to like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye, my guys, gals and non-binary pals. Yep, yeah, see you in another video. Bye.